uh, good to go. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, warm greetings to everyone and welcome to another Architect Hub Hub Talk. Uh, we are very happy to be participating in M Architecture, celebrating March, the month of architecture in Qatar. Uh, my name is Kim Othman, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today. Uh, we are honored to have with us the award-winning architect, Mr. Ibrahim Mohammed Anjaida, who will be talking to us about art in Qatari architecture. Uh, moderating today's talk will be architect Eduardo Gaitan, uh, he's an architect, currently power and construction manager at the uh, Atlas Velocity Qatar. Uh, before I pass to uh, Eduardo, I'd like to share with you uh, a few pointers. Please note that uh, this talk will be recorded and will be live streaming on Facebook. Uh, currently ensure that uh, your mics are on mute throughout the presentation. Uh, feel free to use the chat if you want to comment. <coughs> At the end of the presentation, we will open the session so you can ask any question directly. Please make sure to use the raise hand button and I will invite you in turn. Uh, I will now uh, invite Eduardo to start uh, today's talk. Thank you very much, Asim. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all here connected. Uh, allow me to introduce this talk. Uh, tonight, the architect Ibrahim Jaida um, explores the artistic touch in Qatari architecture and how it uh, manifested through time. Uh, this talk starts by discussing Qatar before oil discovery, uh, exhibiting uh, vernacular architecture and its elements, moving to the oil discovery and its impact, and then sad uh, contemporary architecture to showcase invited projects. Uh, including uh, Iman Mohammed bin Abdel Wahab Mosque and also the, the FIFA 2022 World Cup Stadia. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ibrahim, and I'm pretty sure only a very few, um, Ibrahim Jaida is a, an award-winning architect, uh, well known for uh, delivering world-class projects uh, to the Qatari architecture scene. Uh, graduated from the University of Oklahoma in, in 1982. Eight. Uh, he has acquired AEB, uh, Arab Engineering Bureau, in 1991, and uh, under his leadership, the, the firm grew from six to over 600 uh, highly qualified employees and expanded uh, its presence with uh, branch offices across Middle East and Southeast Asia. Um, Ibrahim has often seen uh, uh, along his professional career the completion of over 1,500 projects, making his studio one of the most influential firms in the region. Uh, he authored uh, the History of Qatari Architecture book in 2010, and the 99 Doms book in 2015, and recently the Qatari Style book. He's frequently invited to speak about the Qatari architecture by well-known institutions across the world. Uh, due to his passion for education, he also became an advisory board member in Virginia Commonwealth University Schools of Art in Qatar and Department of Architecture in Urban Planning at Qatar University. In addition, uh, Ibrahim uh, is a dedicated advocate uh, for sustainability and uh, it's a co-founder of the Qatar Green Building Council. I'm quite sure tonight uh, we will gain a deep understanding uh, of the local culture and, and the lost treasure of Qatari heritage and also about reflecting architecture as a, as a piece of art. I would like to, to remind the audience uh, to stay on mute during the presentation. Um, so Ibrahim, very good evening. Uh, it is good to have you here. And uh, the microphone and the presentation are all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good evening, everybody. Salam alaikum. Uh, sorry, something is wrong with my camera. I'm all dressed up for you guys, but uh, you won't be able to see me, unfortunately. But I have something better to show you, which is the presentation. Now, I'll take you, I'd like to tie up the art uh, with the architecture because uh, I have prepared this uh, a few weeks ago for VCU, but I have developed it uh, for this uh, talk uh, where I'm tying up uh, the art and the architecture and seeing how 
the architecture is developing to become also an art in its own right. Uh, what I usually like to start is this tremendous growth that happened uh, from the 30s, uh, 37 at, the, at that time, uh, life was really tough. The, the artificial pills started coming and uh, all this big industry of pearl diving started uh, disappearing. You know, Qatar at one stage had more than 300 dows during the, the pearl diving season. And all of a sudden, everybody was had no uh, jobs. And uh, there was talk of oil in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And of course, in Iran, it was discovered earlier, but that was too far away for work. So some people started migrating in the 40s uh, for work. But then you could see fr from later in the 40s, 50s, and then there was a uh, within the 50s, the, the city literally uh, has evolved. And that's the pearl diving that we discussed. It was really thriving industry, uh, naturally. Uh, unfortunately, like now, we are fortunate to have the largest uh, gas reserve, one of the largest gas reserves in the world. Most of the pearl diving locations was just a little bit off Doha, and it's all uh, the east side of Qatar was most of the pearl diving. Even people from Kuwait would come all the way here as this was a thriving uh, pearl diving location. And of course, the handcrafts that were supporting it, uh, of course, using the limited materials available or related to the, the palms and the, the trading as people were trading for the pearls going to uh, India and Persia and mostly India, of course, the biggest uh, uh, purchasers of the pearls were the Maharajas. And that's why it was uh, booming where the Maharajas using all these pearls and eventually even the French, there are some famous old picture of Mr. Cartier himself arriving in the Gulf to, to select the pearls, to hand pick them. And most common were of, as a permanent big structures were the forts or the watchtowers uh, as a defense mechanism. But uh, and, you could, and you could see the features uh, on the top of these watchtowers. Some say it because people would sit with their guns when they are shooting to be protected between these features. But I will relate that as, as architecture started developing, it became an, a, a sort of uh, an architectural feature, how to depict the old architecture. Now this stones, the way they are laid. Uh, when I graduated, I started building, uh, I wanted to try building a stone building and to put a piece of stone on the other, they would never stand. And it is said that Abdullah al mail one of the greatest uh, masons that built the, the, um, the museum and built the al -Mana house, the mansions, it is said that when Abdullah al mail lays down a stone, it would fit perfectly well on it. And now trying to build, it was extremely difficult, but this picture shows you how the, these pieces of stone would really fit nicely on top of each other. And since our environment was really, there wasn't much planting. Uh, and that's where I think all the carvings started appearing as uh, the late Hassan Fathi in his famous statement, he said, uh, our courtyards were very simple. It's the stars in the sky were like our garden. And this is where the ca carvings uh, with all their different names and motifs started coming as a decor decorative features. And we saw that in the wood, of course, our, our, the old doors, the very decorative doors were very much influenced by Zanzibar as the trading was happening back and forth in Africa and Zanzibar was uh, very dominant being part of Oman, of course. Uh, that's why the, the influence came through Oman into our, the most carved doors. And of course, the doors were a symbol of uh, welcoming and a, st a status. The larger your door was a big status. And we see wherever possible, they would put these carvings and there is a whole vocabulary of these car carvings, the rose, the cashew, the abstract rose, and wherever possible, these colors. And it's interesting 
in uh, in in this environment where minimum planting was there this is almana house the majlis their majlis still exists uh, in the sugwagaf area facing the the sea but you could see the all the colors in in the glass and the carvings and the architect would literally sign his name with all these carvings in the upstairs majlis this is this is the, this does this part does not exist unfortunately and of course the 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 famous sunduk uh, mbayat which is the box with decorative the and uh, it is said in the the best would come from zanzibar the sesam would they call it and they would put all their uh, all these features on it and that's where it was very important because this is where you put your important precious belonging it's like your safe your fancy safe and the sadu the 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 people uh, in the desert as as our culture is a mix between the sea and the desert had a lot of influence and it, i always was uh, uh, amazed by the the bright red colors the black colors and the white when they put them together in these very simple naive motifs that created the the art of the sadu was also part uh, started developing as part of the 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 art with with things that they were using this is al-majid house it does not exist it's in the uh, grand hamad avenue uh, this house would have been i guess from what i've seen one of the largest houses uh, in qatar i mean recorded houses uh, there are drawings for this house but talking about beauty feature and architectural feature these recesses that you see in the elevations were not decorative even though even though now we depict to create them with the cement or the block work but simply as you go up with the big stones that i've showed you to you need to reduce the weight and they would bring uh, the fasht the, the from the sea the the stones from the sea very flat ones and they would use them in these recesses to create a less weight on, on the wall and it become decorative and they start adding it into the arches uh, and making the, the this is how the vocabulary of the architecture starts evolving into a beautiful feature and this photo i took uh, it would be in the very late 80s uh, and this literally this this monster killed that house in front of my eyes i was the last to be inside that house i took a lot of photos as i was walking out a couple of guys came started pulling out the windows this truck was warming up to to attack uh, if i knew then i would have stopped on the way but that's too big for me to stop on the way and then we were blessed with the oil the oil came and uh, uh, of course it was uh, discovered in the 40s this it was delayed for a while there was the, war, the world wars uh, and then uh, it started being exported. So the beginning, the, the income started really coming in, in, in the 50s. And that's why I showed you how the growth of the city, how the impact, the massive impact has happened. And doing some researches, the, it's interesting. Uh, our rulers' uh, priorities uh, was to build hospitals and schools uh, as I dig deep into what's the early oil period, which hopefully is a book that I'm publishing now, uh, and I'm hoping to come, uh, it comes out by the end of the year. Uh, the first concrete buildings were actually uh, government buildings related to the operation of the country, uh, hospital, schools, and then came the palaces. This picture on the left, you know, I always, when I show this, uh, I talk about the gold rush in California. The movies were all these, uh, everybody with their horses running into California. And this is really similar. There was uh, a, a population explosion in the country at that time. You know, population was 25, 30,000, believe it or not, in the 40s or even early 50s. But then people started coming from all over the region and you could i mean this picture speaks of a million words and we can see the arrival of cement in the street and actually in the building they started the plaster and the block work started arriving however the still the old mason was still in charge 
and that's why the the art the vocabulary of the architecture remained pretty much the same at the very beginning this clock tower you all see it around driving around but this is literally was the statement of the beginning of a construction era the top left photo you could see in the uh, the far left even the d1 amiri was the old fort uh, the qal'at al askar uh, this is where the ottomans uh, were at once upon a time and then as soon as they left uh, sheikh abdullah uh, moved from where the museum now is from that and, and into this prime location and this became the ruler's palace and it evolved, as you see behind the clock tower in the bigger picture, it's, it's, it's an older building, but you could see the steel coming up for where the green uh, Diwan Amiri now, which, which everybody sees as the, what they call it, the, the older annex. And you could see in this picture, some of the buildings started coming up uh, out of cement and out of block work. But even that green, famous green mosque next to the Diwan Amiri was still the old one, which was replaced with, with the green Masjid al-Shuyukh, uh, it, it is called. And, and, and most of these buildings uh, on the left are, is, are the actually government uh, buildings and the, the hospital. Now we're still talking about architecture, but we will get into slowly the art. So at the very beginning, of we started seeing new neighborhoods evolving and the suburbs of the the older Doha, Doha Jadid, uh, Al Asmakh area started evolving uh, very early in the 50s. But we started seeing an interesting deco sort of motifs. These features where, where you usually see them between the corners of the columns, they're being done in a very abstract way. And for some reason, they would do this frame like on top of the entrance and they will do uh, a painting of a tree, of a wadi. Uh, it's sort of a statement on their entrance. And the, the, the arrival of the steel doors, which I'll show you some examples, very decorative steel doors started uh, coming into, into the residential houses. This is Abdullah Hussein Na'ma, the late Abdullah Hussein Na'ma's, uh, it was a house. Eventually, it became the first printing press, uh, Al-Arab. Uh, which uh, later in this, uh, this became in the early 70s, the first printing press where the Al Arab newspaper started coming. But uh, it does resemble uh, one way or another, you could see the book and on top of the book, there is the, the torch of knowledge. Uh, and of course, in these plain white places, I'm sure there was some paintings and the, uh, probably the, the name of, of the printing press. And then it started getting really deco. Uh, this is uh, this is in where Al Asmakh is. This exists, fortunately, and now it's being uh, protected. Is uh, now we have a new, finally, a new happy trend, which is uh, recognizing the early modern as part of our heritage, uh, thanks to the Qatar museums. It started with the schools, some of the. Uh, some of the government buildings, like the old Ministry of Education, which is private engineering office now. So, and slowly this started spreading into uh, houses of the early modern, but this is a quite a rare. There was a lot more of this style, which, which I called the Arabian deco or, or the Qatari deco. And I have redrawn a lot of buildings that has been demolished, which I'll share with you. But I call it Arabian or Qatari because at top of the entrance in the in the bottom right one, you see palm trees and a wadi. So things that really relate, it's a deco, however, it's somehow it relates. This is Sheikh Ali bin Abdullah's palace. It was a ruler's palace also, it's in Rayyan. But we saw the features of the forts and the here the left bottom corner, which was a defense mechanism. Now they are like a heart or spades uh, quite creative and, and the steel work and in the tile work, uh, quite uh, decorative features started being uh, developed. Now, who brought these? Uh, it is, uh, it's still a mystery to me. Uh, I've asked, I'll show you an example where I asked some owners, this, this particular example, this is Sheikh Mohammed bin Hamad uh, Majlis. This is next to the Diwan Amiri, it's quite hidden. Uh, but it's on the left side of the Diwan Amiri. It, is, uh, it has its own fence. 
but this is a celebration of uh, deco decorative features. Some are very pure deco where you see this in any, you know, from in, in, the, in the States, you see these features, but a lot of local carvings with brighter colors have been added among, among these features. Now on the top, uh, on the left bottom, this is part of the majlis. It was like a little apartment, but this is again, uh, no doubt, this is uh, quite a deco movement uh, architecture that was really thriving at that in the 50s and the 60s. This exists, it's in next to Mshareb, Sheikh Ghanem bin Ali's house, very well taken care of, still the family lives there, but with neon lights and these big fish features and quite flowers on the gate. Uh, that was a tendency, most of the Sheikh's houses at that uh, time was a huge celebration of this deco and very grand entrances. As we've seen example in the pre-oil period, how important would be the, the, uh, the gate as a statement of uh, generosity and a status. You could see this being reflected in, in this uh, wonderful, amazing style that came and disappeared. This is in Al Bid'a area, Al Bid'a and Al Rumayla. So there was this modern villas for the engineers, uh, what end quote, the engineers of the the oil uh, industry that came and lived here, the use of glass blocks. But again, the decorative features starts continue. Some are uh, quite strange features, but uh, they're all together and they were quite col colorful. But when this was renovated, it was just painted. And eventually this was eventually ended up being used for labor accommodation until, until that whole area was uh, demolished and a park was put in that place. This, is, this was one of the most beautiful sort of villas that, that was there. It doesn't exist. I've, I have managed to redraw the elevation at least uh, for the new publications in, in details. But it, it's really, you could see the eagle uh, on, 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 on top of the windows and the stars and the steelwork even was quite decorative. This gate uh, still exists in uh, Rayan, uh, not far away from Sugwagif, uh, in, uh, in Rayan Street area. It's Al Atiyah's house. This one really got, uh, even the flowers are three dimensional. The gate still exists, not in a perfect condition. Fine. Kill a beaut, Gabal Country. You don't kill bait? Naam. Hello. Uh, Ibrahim, your microphone is muted. Sorry for the interruption, somebody. Uh, a, a reminder, please keep your microphones uh, on, on muted uh, during the presentation. Thank you very much. You hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Please continue. Sorry for the this. This is the bottom of the entrance, and you can see even paintings of the wadis, like we said, and the rivers. I mean, this is, a, I guess, it's, it's a typical fantasy of somebody living in a dry rigid environment and when they travel they see these things they like to bring them back but look how important and how much of a statement these 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 uh, doors and gates uh, are the, definitely it, the visitor to to that uh, house or palace would be so, uh, sort of amazed prior to entering this is uh, in Mishareb, actually near where the Al Eid prayer this is Salam Al Jabr uh, house very decorative. Uh, I've been, we played in this house as children because I didn't, I lived quite close to this. But uh, the, look at the palm with its uh, full details and the features of the parapets, uh, very much deco and the use of glass blocks. They were quite uh, the state of the, uh, the state of the art and, and when it comes to construction at that stage. Uh, and like I said, you know, I asked uh, the, the owner passed away uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, about 20 years ago, and I asked him uh, who designed this. And this statement I still quote, 
He said, what do you mean who designed it? I told the guy to do what to do and this is, it was built like the, I, I wanted it. So you could never really trace who was the, the architect, but there was a lot of effort and the craftsmanship put into these things. Some early different features, but then we started also seeing the apartment buildings with the influx of population, the apartment buildings were needed and you could see the doors on, on the balconies like the old fashioned dormitories done when we were students in the States, uh, the balconies and the doors and the windows there, but the, the, the decorations and the parapets uh, continue to be quite uh, interesting at that stage. And the, the steel doors later in the 60s, the 70s really was a thriving industry. And I remember this, you would see this in every neighborhood and every corner and the guys were really busy. Some of these steel doors have actually replaced beautiful wooden doors. And uh, these wooden doors were purchased by visitors and a lot of them have left the country and everybody wanted to, to have something more durable, less maintenance at that, at that time. But uh, a nice, interesting, different type of features were put, uh, you could see this on a small scale. We've seen the big magnificent deco gates, but even for the humble, simple uh, house, uh, simple courtyard, they wanted to make the statement in their doors with, with, the, with the steel works. And different patterns, flowers started coming. Some of these flowers come from the local government, but a lot of them came from different places uh, from the artists that were actually manufacturing these doors. There is a quite a, a bit of collection already exists with private collectors, uh, fortunately, of these doors. And this is Jasim Zeni, the late Jasim Zeni. As you could see, uh, Jasim Zeni graduated from Baghdad, I think in the early 60s. Uh, so these paintings were done in the 70s, but you could see uh, how much they are appreciating the, the, the old traditional uh, folklore uh, at that stage because of the fast growth and they wanted to sort of document the, the, the old uh, traditions and the stories that they heard when they were children. And then later in the 70s, there was, they have reclaimed what now you see this fancy corniche and where the Sheraton is. Uh, as teenagers, we, we used to go and cruise there because they just backfilled this area. We couldn't imagine what's going to go there. Uh, but we saw this amazing steel pyramid was being erected. Uh, and there was a talk about a Korean company and their Korean people coming to build this uh, pyramid, which, which, uh, which eventually became the Sheraton. And all that area was man-made and, and uh, backfilled, uh, reclaimed. And of course, there was a whole bunch of uh, sort of beautiful, important government buildings to, 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 to develop in the West Bay. And the West Bay was divided for, for plots. Uh, William Pereira designed it as stepping from the Corniche and it goes up to higher. Eventually the planning has changed because this, this area stayed empty for quite a while, but the government buildings uh, were like the statement building. There was a boom for beautiful, buildings, the Doha Club, the post office, the Ministry of Culture, and of course the Diwan Amiri uh, and the Sheraton. And the firehouse, of course, this was, uh, and I always appreciate the sensitivity to how to screen the, the hot sun uh, as it was sort of a fashion at that era in the architecture in different places of the world. And uh, in the Later in the 80s and very early in the 90s, uh, the government wanted to put art features everywhere in the roundabouts. So each roundabout had a name uh, related to this piece of art uh, at that stage. The, the artwork was done by, designed by local or people living here actually. So nobody was really commissioned, but there was attempts and small competitions were done. So this will be called the parachute or the arch building. Interestingly, the arch building is eventually, now we saw it as evolving at the, uh, the big, beautiful two arches uh, heading towards Lucille. And a lot of, some of it were directly representative of 
the local accessories that we were using. This was called al-amrashta. This is where you put the rose water in and you very commonly used. And then the, the sails. And of course, the famous oyster. Fortunately, uh, all, fortunately, this was protected now and sh uh, shifted to Sug uh, al-Wakra. Uh, and then the famous oryx, this is removed, but the oryx is on top, have been moved to the oryx uh, farm. And then there was the, the big boom. The 90s came and there was a lot of construction happening. Uh, buildings were literally popping up in the West Bay uh, as towers. The government did something interesting at that stage. They said, we'll not build any more government buildings. He who builds a tower, we will rent. And so there was... Uh, uh, tremendous growth on these uh, buildings. Uh, and we started seeing downtown with lots of glass buildings. And very fortunately, later in the 90s, the government has uh, realized that, uh, wait a minute, before we lose our identity, every town had a, has a downtown in this uh, modern world. But there was uh, a beginning of a comeback uh, to the cultural uh, identity not only in the construction, but in all aspects of the culture, the poetry, the, the sports, and every other element of uh, culture. And for that, there was two directions in the government that I have witnessed. One, let's go back to the local vernacular where we ended and start being inspired by the local vernacular. So we saw our a big movement of the local vernacular, very representative of, of the, sim, uh, the architecture uh, of the past, but yet put in slightly in a modern way, especially when it comes to the function. Uh, and this school continued happening as it became a trend. While these glass buildings were happening, this was sort of a reaction. And it was uh, the commissions I've, I've worked on these buildings and it was the, the commission was very clear we want something really vernacular uh, eventually this came in, even in the sugwagif and we saw this uh, this beautiful statement the very simple architecture but this is al gabib it was inspired by al gabib mosque uh, which was uh, in the seven, later in the 1700s actually was in al zabara the in the 1800s uh, the founder sheikh jasim so that and he wanted to put one like it and there was there is one existing now in Sug al ahmed area uh, which is the original one uh, that was built in doha and his highness the emir father uh, instructed the build, uh, to build one of similar uh, identity of the al gabib mosque uh, making it as uh, a statement now considering the simplicity of the architecture back in the days building a dome or several domes was really a genius for the, the, the local masons. So that's why it was a very important architectural vocabulary that has been translated into this uh, simple yet beautiful uh, piece of architecture. Uh, I had the honor of working in the interiors. The architecture was uh, started already being put up, but in the interiors working also with the, uh, the the master builder in our new era, Muhammad Ali, uh, who, who had played a major role in rebuilding the Sugh Waqif. Uh, and we started putting the local carvings, uh, researching into the doors and all the, uh, the features of the interiors. And then also, of course, government building had to become sort of a statement of local v vocabulary. Uh, this is inspired uh, by uh, a Maslal uh, fort, the, the Najd style of curved walls, but yet it had to look fortresses and to make uh, uh, a statement. Uh, this, this school of vernacular continued. Uh, this is a Rayan municipality. I showed this to a friend of mine, an architect, a European architect, and he said, this is really minimalist and simple, and it could be seen as, uh, as modern as, uh, as possible, also with this plain, beautiful simplicity of the walls. This is al Dain municipality, also this commission. So that direction of government 
to sort of revive the local vernacular continued. We try to get away with a little bit more contemporary and we with some sometimes we get away with slight features of blowing up the carvings uh, and making it as a feature but uh, but the the direction was very simple to, to 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 go to the direction of the local vernacular then the 2000s came and uh, the tendency to bring star architects uh, which was really making uh, the architectural movement making the architectural movement really thrive uh, with uh, an influx of well-known architects coming. And the beauty of, of the direction of the government was still uh, do your best as a famous architect, yet it has to belong one way or another to our culture. And this is the genius Jean Novelle, Jean Novelle where he takes the, 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 paths, the Islamic or the Arabic patterns into the skin of, of this uh, beautiful building. Uh, I, we try to attempt also to do something similar where we shade, but in the inside, creating a courtyard with Mashrabiya feature. You've seen this building from the outside, but you go in the heart of this building and to see the, uh, the, the, the light coming in through these contemporary Mashrabiya is really is an interesting thing. So now, a new vocabulary or a new dimension of the identity. The, and I keep saying now, even this, after learning uh, with these years, telling the students, uh, the, your identity is not only the skin of an old building, your environment is your identity, the color of your sea is the identity, the formation of the sand is your identity. And these, uh, all these features really have, uh, or this architecture has started developing a different dimension. This is HOK's attempt, I mean, uh, HOK's attempt or design of the airport. Uh, trans I've seen the presentation uh, at the concept stage where they describe the sea and the importance of the sea for, for us to travel and to meet other cultures. And this is where the weight of the sea started coming up into this architecture. And I enjoy, unfortunately, in not, we, we, we don't get to see the airports as much as we used to for the last uh, 12, 13 months. But uh, I started calling uh, our airport an art port of the amount of beautiful art. This is Ali Hassan's famous horse. And uh, of course, the teddy bear and different, uh, the Mark Quinn uh, sculptures. And we, we see it's really becoming an art port, a gallery in its own right. And this reflects also the, the art movement that's happening throughout the city. You'll be surprised within the next six to uh, six months to one year, the amount of public art that you're gonna be seeing around as uh, Qatar Museum working hard with local and international artists uh, to, to put so much art within, within our city. Uh, uh, it, it will definitely be like, uh, like our town is becoming a celebration of contemporary international artists and local artists, it will become also a gallery, a big open gallery for the visitors. Azawi's uh, piece of art there, it's, uh, I enjoy looking at it. Actually, I missed uh, the airport too, too. And all of you have seen all these beautiful pieces of art. And then we started seeing some of the the architecture becoming an art in its own right. Uh, one of my favorite architects and favorite gentlemen that I have worked with in my uh, career is Arata Yusazaki and taking the Sidra into a beautiful contemporary architecture uh, inspired by the Sidra. Again, it still relates Sidra, the, the Qatar Foundation, the Sidra is our national tree and you, you, you challenge the architects to do something that belongs this this beautiful uh, project. I mean, of course, the Qatar Foundation is, is, is a, an architectural tour in its own right. The Rimkul has the library, and you can see the, the buildings are really becoming uh, uh, like a piece of art uh, and a statement. And this is Al-Bahrani's uh, 
art and the, now in, the art is being integrated within the architecture and even in the in the the souk wagif the old souk and we would be seeing hopefully a lot more of these happening around us in the city the sidra at certain stage back when i was when i was young uh, sculptures and so on were not really very much uh, uh, accepted but we we could see this evolving now uh, into a different dimension also uh, i enjoy driving uh, around that area and we started also, this is one of the buildings that uh, we celebrated the acknowledging our early modern uh, architecture as, as part of our heritage. And it's not only that, but the, with the Qatar Museum uh, transforming this building into an artist residence. And we see this tendency, uh, the amount and the number of local artists that uh, has evolved in the last only 10 years is, is incredible uh, with, with the work that is of international standards. And of course, uh, Musharib, Musharib, I always give it as an example of how to take the local vernacular really into a very modern context. Uh, you don't see glass buildings here. There's a big respect to the orientation, to the amount of sun that you get uh, inside the courtyards, even the type of plantation that is planted within this area is very much in respect of the local vernacular, but taken, taking us into a different dimension, which um, really uh, started calling the birth of uh, a new uh, contemporary Qatari style uh, has evolved. And with these attempts, again, the integration with the international creativity put together with, with the local context creating uh, uh, vocabulary. And of course, the celebration of the Katara cultural village, celebration of the international cultures everywhere within that vicinity is, uh, is, is, is a piece of art by itself and the art contents that it's having everywhere with, within it. And then we come again, this is when I, I give this as an example, even when it comes to local identity put in a different dimension, but it becomes also uh, an artistic piece. This, this is a real genius solution and a concept that uh, it's not easy to match really around, around the world and just walking around there uh, gives you this a different feeling. And what I love about this, how the old museum, uh, the old palace became as part of the display of the art uh, display or the architectural display within this magnificent uh, building. And of course, you see the work installation around that. That's my uh, dear friend Ahmed Al Bahrani's monument that he is always proud of. And uh, Sheikh Hassan's. Batola, and we can see you know, very local features being developed also as, 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 as an art. This is an attempt for a car parking where you need to screen and you take the sadhu as if you're literally covering the building with a piece of cloth uh, into it. This is, this is starting construction soon. This is something that we have done as a visitor center. This was a part of a concept for the sea line. Now we go to the dunes. We wanted a visitor center and a display area. Uh, this, this is a like, sort of taking the dune into a contemporary dimension. And of course, we cannot conclude architecture and art without uh, referring and also the direction of the local uh, identity in a, in a different dimension, which the government is driving. Of course, the famous Khalifa Stadium has always been there and extended. It's our pride and it's our sort of uh, main stadium that celebrated the football in, in, in the history of Qatar. But we started seeing even uh, an architectural beauty coming from international architects uh, in, in different stadium. I've been inside this building. It's, it's really something very special. And of course, the Zaha Hadids, again, the water, the Wakra, being the, one of the most important pearl diving cities and trading, uh, I mean, towns within Qatar. And to put this uh, masterpiece 
of the water waves, the the inside, the structure of the inside. When I was there, it was it's really amazing. It's really it's like the structure of the the inner part of the Dao. And Rayan Ahmed bin Ali Stadium is a celebration of the local carvings. These carvings are very much local. And this is being translated even in the interiors uh, of the VIPs and the VVIPs and some of the public areas. And the bait, uh, if you haven't been there, you go there, you have goosebumps of the scale of this tent and the shadow that's being put inside. It's, uh, it's really a celebration of a culture and uh, a statement. Uh, this will be remembered by all the visitors that's going to come to Doha. Uh, uh, the Lusail, uh, if you drive by there and you see the, the quality of the construction and the, the challenges of the, this to achieve such uh, uh, an amazing piece of architecture uh, which is being put together in its, uh, its final stages now because the facade is, is ready by Sir Norman Foster. Mm. And of course, the recyclable, uh, the first uh, dismantable uh, stadium. And uh, finally, the Gahfiya, uh, again, cel a celebration of a local culture in an extremely contemporary way. I mean, putting an, an image and getting the proportions correct uh, I thought it was difficult, but putting the engineering where we had about 17 consultants from all over the world uh, with the facade, with the FIFA compliance, even even the, the, the grass, the pitch, the grass had a consultant working on it to put this together. And I think the part of the World Cup, the, the, a, a tour on the stadiums and the vocabulary of the stadium, I think we're putting a new dimension, the, the next stadiums that are going to be built around the world they're going to really have a, a challenge matching these qualities but it's going to create also the tendency of having a sort of an identity to where whichever cities they're going to be built in and with that i hope i didn't take too long i'd like to thank you for listening to me ibrahim uh, thank you very much it has been and uh, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, impressive the amount of information that that that, that you have there. I'm I'm pretty sure that, that the book is going to be an amazing book, and and we cannot wait uh, till we see uh, your your new publication. Um, you you got a commitment that you said that that, that this is going to be released at the end of this year. Uh, so. We will be waiting for it. Uh, so, so very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to start uh, right now with a, a question and, and, and answer session. Uh, before we start with it, um, um, I'd like to remind uh, everyone that wants to participate on it, please raise your hand. Uh, Slim is going to be uh, coordinating uh, for it. We have received um, a couple of questions on the registration, and we have another of uh, another couple of questions uh, uh, active right now. So we are going to start, uh, Ibrahim, with uh, one question that that was uh, submitted on the registration from Hisham Gadas, and uh, it's a very interesting one. It's uh, he's asking about what substantial elements could develop and enrich arts in architecture and regional cultural life to keep an identity impact persistent with the time factor for a recognizable future? Uh, what, can you just repeat the first part, please? <laughs> yes, what substantial elements could develop and enrich arts and architecture and regional cultural life to keep an identity impact? Well, uh, I think the art uh, is a, an extremely important element uh, to develop uh, even your architecture eventually. Uh, as we seek to be inspired by elements of the culture, uh, I think the artist, the way the, uh, and we've seen this in the, uh, with the local young artist movement, where they take also the local, heritage, but put in a totally different, different, translated into different dimension. 
uh, having put this together, I think a new identity is being formed uh, both in the arts and in the architecture. And these elements go together quite well. And we've seen that even reflected in some of the architecture uh, itself. Uh, I hope I covered part of this question. <laughs> Yes, uh, especially because you have mentioned uh, a crucial lecture uh, as well, how important was uh, this uh, local identity construction, even that, that we are, uh, let's say, on a, on a very rapid growth process here in, in, in Qatar. I mean, the evolution that, that Qatar has had through, through the time, as you have explained and through, through the presentation. Um, has been a, a very fast one, right? It's 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 very hard to assimilate the speed of all the process that that Qatar has been uh, suffering with the oil uh, stage, and and apart from that, well, with all the evolution that we have seen through through the last year, plus the evolution that will come, uh, of course, not only with the World Cup but with all the all, all the events that, that that we are going to have in the future. Um, okay, there is um, another question. Um, uh, Sevida uh, Durange is asking about, is there any traces of Ottoman architecture in Qatar? No, no traces. I mean, the Ottomans have stayed in the uh, Qala'at al-Askar, which is where the Diwan Amiri is. There's an older part of it. Of course, the scale has grown tremendously on that Diwan Amiri, but there was uh, a building where the Ottoman uh, soldiers were at, but uh, unfortunately there was no buildings that was built by them. They, they used the local builders to build that for them. Okay, there, there's one, um, one open question that is, do we know what has happened with the artwork, with the public artwork that, that were in the roundabouts uh, in Qatar? Uh, before we transform the city with the new highway system. I, I guess that this uh, re reflects to all these sculptures that you have shown on the, on the, on the presentation, the, the, uh, the jars with the, the rose water and all these um, old pieces of, of uh, art that were, uh, let's say, part of the, of the, of the city and, uh, and are not there anymore. They exist only in on my laptop now. <laughs> I have that shell one, which has been uh, before it's too late, uh, because uh, now there is a lot of appreciation onto these beautiful pieces that meant a lot for us once upon a time. They were landmarks. You would say uh, the, you know, there wasn't even some, most of the streets didn't even have names. So you'd say you take the, the, the shell roundabout, you take the second right or the left right, you, you describe it, they were landmarks, you know where you are. That shell sculpture is sitting in, in the Sugwag of, of, uh, of Wakra, but other than that, unfortunately, they only exist in our memories. And, and, and I hope uh, soon in your new book as well. I hope so. <laughs> Very good. Thank you very much. Um, if there is a, um, if, if there are some more questions, please feel free to write it or type it on the on the chat or to raise your hand. Um, I will ask uh, another one for you, Rahim. That is, um, um, apart from this rapid evolution that uh, that uh, we have seen here, how do you think? Uh, I mean, your generation uh, has been uh, evolving with. Uh, with different speed from, from uh, today's generation. Today's generation have been uh, able to have been able to, to see Jan Nouvel's uh, new museum uh, and a lot of artistic uh, architectural uh, contemporary amazing things. How do you think next generation is going to respond uh, on, on Qatar's uh, identity? Uh, preservation or, or how will be this process in the future for Qatar, considering what we are living today? I think they're going to go, I mean, they will enjoy uh, imagination as my, you know, my generation's reference was what we've seen as children, which is the Sugwa given all this area. And uh, as the transition happened later in the 60s and so on, 
the growth was very simple, but you know, there came slowly this deco that we have seen. But and the, so we had limited really references and our even definition of culture was limited to the architecture of the past. And you've seen this even happen in early in my own career, which is relatively recent. But for this young creative uh, designer, uh, architects and designers and artists, the references they're gonna have with all this uh, star architects working here, but who not working doing uh, things that they would do otherwise, uh, other places, they, would, they are inspired by the local culture and put together. So you, I think the architecture and the art movement that we're gonna see in the next decade is going to really take the identity into a totally different dimension. And it's a really exciting period for these young creative people. And now in, in, uh, you would see in Msherib with the design district uh, uh, and all these different districts, I think you'd, uh, we're, we're going through a renaissance for, uh, for, the, for the art movement, I think. Very good. Ibrahim, thank you very much for your presentation uh, and thank you everyone for attending. It has been a, a, an amazing evening and uh, we had a, a good, good, very good time and a, and a very good journey to, to, to all this uh, amazing information. Uh, so our pleasure to, to, to be able to, to listen to you today and, and to see your presentation and um, and uh, let's uh, uh, please stay in touch. Uh, uh, we are an architecture and, and we, will, we would like to hear from you if you have additional questions or comments that you want to do even after, after this um, uh, talk, uh, there, there will be channels provided to, to communicate. And um, so thank you very much once again, Ibrahim. Uh, very, uh, very good to have you uh, tonight. And, and, and we hope to see you very soon uh, next time with, uh, with the video yes. uh, or, or even in presence, uh, face to face, it will be if the situation yeah. gets Thank better. You. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much for hosting and for your support to the architecture. Uh, really a good effort by all of you. Uh, I salute you for uh, bringing the architects and the creative people together and hosting it. Thank you so much and thank you for all the listeners and sorry about my camera one more time i'll i'll try to sort it out on next time and hopefully it will be in person uh, that we sit together and look at each other thank you so much and have a wonderful okay. night you too thank you very much thank you very much omey maslim the architects hub uh, for for the event uh, it has been it has been a, a very good one and uh, have uh, everyone a very good night thank you thank you Thank you all for being with us tonight. Sorry for the small technical issue that we faced in the beginning. Uh, we'll take care of it next time. Stay tuned. We have many events in uh, this uh, M architecture. And uh, stay safe. We'll meet soon, inshallah. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.